Hey, welcome to part two of the Fender Super Reverb Amplifier Repair. This is the amp that you saw last week. It came up here from a guy in Ohio. He's only 15 years old, used his life savings to purchase a classic tube amp. I thought, wow, how great is that? Unfortunately, after he played it for a short period of time, the amp was overheating. And he figured that out and he shut it off, contacted me, and sent it up here for evaluation. Turns out it lost negative bias, so the output tubes overheated, and that's what he smelled. So it's a good thing he killed it when he did. I was able to repair that, put in the stock tubes, and the amp plays. So in part two, we're going to go in now and change the caps on the eyelet board. We're going to repair the tremolo circuit, because he said that's out too, right? Then we'll put in the stock tubes and give her another shot. But I've got another little surprise for you in this video. D-Lab is going to check out a new multimeter. I've got this Hayoki, okay? It's the model DT4265. It's actually an auto range meter. You guys know that I don't normally use an auto range meter, but I have a, a future application coming up where I may need one. So I did some research on this company, and they're straight shooters, guys. These guys in Japan that build it are kind of like the Fluke and Tektronics of the USA, right? So I thought, I'm going to give it a shot. So in this video, I'm not going to do a comparison between this and other meters. I'm just going to use it. I'm going to tell you my opinion as we go along. So on with part two. All right, we'll just start out by changing out the caps. I've got this nifty overhead camera set up so you guys can see it as I'm doing it because I know a lot of you have been asking for that. All right, so as usual, I'm just going to start at this side of the eyelet board and whoosh, go across, all right? So these grid caps, I just changed them, okay? something I routinely do to protect your output tubes. You don't have to change these if you don't want to, okay? It's just something I do, right? But I will return these to the owner so someday he wants to put it back to stock, he can, right? A lot of you chimed in, well I can't believe you're changing those, you don't even check them. You're right, I don't. These amps are sent in to me to have the caps replaced. So guess what? I replace them, okay? I like using these big Sprague orange drop caps for the grids of the output tubes. They got a little more meat to them. I know there's other manufacturers out there but I'm a fan of the Sprigs. <laughs> well, I get a camera in there and I can't put a cap in, can I? Oh, I'm at. Come on, I let. Here we go. <laughs> Stay. All right. So initially, I just place them, okay? Then I'll come in later. Do a balancing act there. Because my solder's fighting me too, it doesn't want to unspool. So I'll have to address that in a minute. Just want to get these in. I'm going to move around my way down the board. Okay. Let's take care of the solder so it won't look like a moron trying to do this. I'm just falling all over the place. Okay. Got solder now, all right? All right, let's get these out of here now. These old dried up electrolytics, we're just going to clip them out of here.
lead herself a little trail. So you can see the size of these creature features and what I'm putting in their place, much smaller. Modern technology, right? Okay. So now I'll change all the electrolytics and then we're going to get rid of this ugly thing and somebody put this in. It looks like uh, kind of a cheap part. Okay. So we'll change those out with maybe the Mallory's that I have in stock. Then we're going to buzz out these resistors because a lot of these are the 10% resistors and they have a tendency to drift way out of tolerance, okay? So when we get done, we really don't want some old drift omatic resistors in here, okay? All right, let's get those caps in. So now we're on full overhead view. So what I do is I pull the positive lead, okay, completely. So we'll get this cap in place. Make sure he stays in there. Then this lead, you'll find that Fender would take the ground lead with those caps and they would actually just route it through the eyelet. And that's this lead right here. So don't try to pull it out because it ain't going to go anywhere. Okay. So I J-hook in the negative leads. Knock off any corrosion that we may have. De loop there, bring him under. You may think, well, why not just pull it out and run a new ground runner? Well, I really don't like to interrupt these grounds, okay? Doing this little J hook method is fine, you're not going to have any issues. you're not interrupting the other grounds on the eyelets okay so that one's in keep going and I do them one at a time just to kind of avoid confusion yeah I could pluck them all out then I might mess up and hook the cap to the wrong terminal I mean there's always that chance right might as well just leave yourself some breadcrumbs on the way. That's what I do. Same deal. We're going to bring these two caps down now. And Jay hook them in. So it is a little bit different having that camera in front of me. I'm afraid I'm going to smack my head on it. Okay, same deal. Bring them both through. Solder them up. So I probably go through a spool of solder. One of these, uh, I don't know what it is, maybe it's a pound. That's a good question, isn't it? Huh, that's interesting. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I go through one of these spools about once a year or so. 
I've got some other gauges of solder I use for like Snozoramus and you know heavier type soldering. I'm not going to go through a bunch of this little 30,000 stuff. But I go through a lot of solder. So maybe some soldering company can say, hey Terry, we're going to send you a spool of our solder. Why don't you try that out? <laughs> that doesn't happen very often here, guys. I normally uh, don't uh, demonstrate or review products, mainly because I'm always doing this kind of work and you guys know what I'm already using. Okay, But now this meter is going to be a different story. It's going to be kind of fun with the auto range to go through here and hit all these resistors without having to fool around that range switch. Okay, I've never been a person that was really into uh, auto range meters because um, I'll tell you a little story. Okay, you'll probably like this. When I was in the Air Force, I was in uh, quality assurance. So I got to go out to missile sites and watch people working on equipment. Okay, and they're following tech data when they're doing it. So they had these gigantic books and they're out there working on the missile systems. And these were Minuteman missiles. So they're nukes, right? So every step they did had to be correct. And that's why we had tech data. Well, we just started using auto range multimeters. And you know, I was watching this guy working. Of course, I'm not allowed to say anything. I just get to sit there and watch. And he was working on this piece of equipment, let's just say. And he was looking for 200 volts DC. Okay. Well, he hooked up to the test points, but he didn't realize that he had never turned the piece of equipment on. So he was going through the checkout and the auto range meter auto ranged, right? It went down into the millivolt scale because there's no voltage there and he didn't realize that, right? So by chance it came up on the meter display 200 millivolts just happened to be some residual voltage hanging out there, right? Well, he thought it was 200 volts. So he called it good, continued on with the checkout, and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Because that auto range meter fooled him, right? And of course it doesn't help when you got somebody sitting there inspecting you, right? So anyway, he made the error, I sat there and he was progressing along with the checkout. And then he was looking for like 28 volts DC. And sure enough, it was like 27.5 millivolts. I'm not kidding you. So he called that good too. And as the checkout went on, all of a sudden some of the voltages weren't right. And then he finally realized the error that he had never turned this power on to this uh, piece of equipment. So he caught his mistake. He turned it on, he went back and reperformed the steps, and you know, everything was fine. That's how quality assurance worked in the service. We didn't just say, oh, stop, I gotcha, right? We, we allowed them to catch a mistake, and the most you give them is a delay in maintenance. And that's what happened. But ever since that day, I knew that an auto range meter could mess with you, okay? So I've always had ranging meters. If I want to measure like 150 volts, I would put my ranging meter at 200. And if I saw 150, guess what? It's 150. <laughs> so I've been reluctant to do this. But I have a future application where I'm going to need an auto range meter that you guys will see in some future videos. So this would just be a good opportunity to check it out. Okay, I had to add another cord here. Battery in the camera is about dead. So that'll probably give me something else I can trip up on. I'm sure you guys probably like watching if I do something wrong. Oh look! Oh look at he did! <laughs> hey, you know what guys? We all make mistakes, okay? I mean every once in a while I actually get shocked on these things if I uh, forget the golden rule of discharging it. 
so doesn't always work out perfectly here either. I try my best. Okay, here we go. All right, so we're going to put in a nice little Mallory in the place of that checklet, whatever that was. I don't know what it was. So this is a Mallory 150M series. Oh yeah, and I did make another mistake. Let's see if any guys caught it um, when I was talking about the model number of that meter. I called it a 4265. It was actually a 4256. I think what tripped me up on that was thinking of Marantz model numbers, right? It was ended in like 45, 55, 65. I had a uh, the 2275 receiver, I think it was. Beautiful blue dial with a gyro tuning. I love that thing. I should not have gotten rid of it because back when I got it, they were like 100 bucks, right? And now, what are they? Over a thousand at least. But they're a cool receiver. I don't know if you guys remember the commercials where they would uh, throw the Marantz like out the window of a car and then take it in, you know, plug it in, it's still played. Or they pull one out of a house fire, right? And the thing would still play. Kind of like uh, the Timex commercials, I'm sure you guys remember that, right? Where they strapped the watch to the bottom of a boat. Did all kinds of torture testing on that stuff. That was back in the good old days when they really cared about quality. Nowadays, if it just gets past that warranty, you're good to go. Because the consumer is just going to go out and buy a new one anyway. Got those caps in. Oh, we're going to change the LDR, but first I'll show you the symptom of it because I'm at a point where I can fire this thing up, show you what's going on with the tremolo. But I'm sure the LDR is bad. We've got new ones here that I buy through the Tube Depot. So these have like an LED with the little photo cell, whereas these had the neon lamp in the photo cell. I have a high failure rate of these. I think they're just aging. Alright, let me show you the symptom on the tremolo. So I've got the amp on. And I actually have a speaker hooked up to it. You hear that? Okay, so to turn on the tremolo, normally you'd have your pedal, right? And it would just short that jack. If you look right there, you see a little pulse? That's a little neon lamp doing his thing. So if you had the volume up, you cranked up your intensity, so you can just barely hear it. That's full intensity. Normally it would rock the ship when you bring up the intensity. This one's working but it's extremely weak. So that could be simply the neon is dying or the little photo cell in there is bad but we're just gonna go ahead and change it okay so since I saw it oscillating I know that that circuitry is okay and since we can hear it in the speaker we know that it's getting to the output tubes but the intensity is very low okay so let's swap it out alright so we're gonna go ahead and replace the LDR okay so when you look at this you see this little dot that's called the optic side okay so a good way to remember it is like the optical eye okay so your optics go to the rear because that is the oscillation side okay so he lays like this and then these two leads this is the resistive side okay so that faces the front of the amp all right I've zoomed in a little bit so you can see the replacement of the LDR be a little bit cautious so you don't torch this wire harness. But these leads are 
fairly small they pop right out real easy also don't want to bake the new cap I just put in Okay, that one's out. Put in our new one. I do trim these leads back just a little bit, but you will find that there's not a whole lot of excess lead here to work with. Okay. And there's plenty of room underneath the eyelet board. Swing him under here. These leads are going to dive down into the optical side. Don't sweat it guys if you end up with a little extra lead length here. It's not going to affect the sound of the amp at all. Once again, I got that camera that wants to smack me in the head. So I find it kind of interesting, you know, that they can make a solid state type of component, you know, that changes the neon lamp. I've never actually uh, tore one of these apart. Alright, I got the new one installed. Amps powered up. Tremolo is down. So no tremolo. Now I'm going to bring up the intensity. You can really hear her pulsating now. So that should take care of the tremolo. Unfortunately, you lose a little flashing light. But that's just the way it is. Alright, so all the caps are replaced. Now we're going to move into the resistors. Okay. So I've got the Hioki meter set up for auto range ohms. We're just going to sweep from one side of the board to the other, and then I'll check those 470 ohm resistors go into the screens. So here we go. That guy's right on the money. These are 100Ks. I just walked down the board. That one's a little high. This should be 1.5K. Ooh, about 1.8. A lot of beep beeping going on there. Okay, here's another 100K. Another one. Another one. Okay. Alright, here is a 820. Okay. So far, I really like the speed of the update of this meter. So on their website, they actually advertise that it has a super fast update on the meter and that was another thing I never liked about uh, auto range meters is they're dirt slow right but this one isn't this one's pretty stinking quick whoa it's supposed to be 100k guys what do we got going on here all right so here is one 100k here's the other maybe I'm just not getting a good connection up oh, there he is 110k good okay so far so good Yeah. Huh. Well, I like it so far, guys. Here is the 100K going to our Tremolo LDR. And over here is a 10 meg. Let's see if it sees it. Look at there. 10.3 meg. All right. So far, I'm impressed with the ohms reaction of the meter. It's uh, It's pretty cool. As for the case itself, it's really rugged, okay? The switch feels like a real switch. Very sturdy meter. All right, 
that guy's out. So another thing that I'm not a huge fan of, well, number one, losing my solder whip is a problem. i put it, oh, there it is, okay. I know that Fender built these amps like forever and uh, they just pushed the leads through the tube sockets. And I'm kind of like, well, I guess it worked all this time, right? But I believe in a mechanical connection. So I don't believe that solder is really intended to make the mechanical bond. I think solder is kind of like the glue, but you need some kind of a mechanical bond first, okay? Because solder is soft and does have a tendency to crack, right? Think about circuit boards, guys. Those leads push through, right? And what happens with a little bit of uh, vibration over time? Connections crack. So I always do a little J-hook through the terminals here. Get, get a good uh, mechanical bond. Once again, do what you want. You know, it's just my preference. Um, in this case, there's not a whole bunch of stuff that's clogging up these uh, these pins. I've got plenty of room to wrap the lead through, so why not just do it? Uh, there's like massive solder on this guy. I'm also not a fan of solder suckers. I like to use wick even though it's more expensive. I find that wick gives you a little bit of uh, heat sinking of the item that you're pulling the solder away from. It's really important on circuit boards because if you overheat that trace it's going to lift. You've got another problem, right? Anyway, Wick isn't all that horribly expensive. If you do buy it though, don't buy the generic crap. Spend the extra money and get the Chem Wick, okay? Because this has the rosin in the wick and it pulls the solder. A lot nicer than some of those no-name wicks. You'll find that those no-name ones just look like a piece of copper, right? Whereas solder wick kind of has that white appearance to it, right? Doesn't look like shiny copper. It kind of has a white appearance, and that's because of the rosin that's in it. So next step, we're going to add these one-ohm current shunts. So you see this braided wire that comes off of pin 8 ground? We're going to replace that with these and that will allow me to measure directly the current going through the output tubes. Rather than having to do a bunch of fancy calculations for bias, you just throw a meter on here, measuring the millivolts, and it's directly proportional to the current going through the tube. I've got screen resistors in. Now, I'm going to pull this braid loose from pin 8 both of these. You'll find there's some wires in your way. There we go. Get this wire away from there because I'm going to be applying some heat to those in a minute. I'm going to clean these holes out so I can get the new little resistor rods in there. It also kind of intrigued me how Fender did this uh, right angle filament wiring. How did they figure all that stuff out, guys? How did they figure out how to put the brass plate under here, you know, to reduce the noise? A little magic with the filament stuff, their little balancing network. 
on the uh, pilot lamp. I mean, did they build amps that were like a complete disaster and then said, oh geez, maybe we better add, uh, you know, some kind of grounding system here or whatever they did. It's pretty amazing what the fender amp line went through. But they obviously did everything right because they're still playing, right? How many amps built today on circus boards? are going to be around in 50 years and you'll be watching them uh, repair it on a video anybody got a guess I'm thinking none because these new amps can barely get through their warranty let's just go back to the hardwired amps All right. So I've got the shunts hooked up on pin 8 and now I need to heat up this area here and here so that we can swing the resistors down onto the chassis. And when you do that you can't use the little itty bitty soldering irons. This tip cannot transfer enough heat to the chassis. So I'm sure you guys know what I use, right? It's a little uh, childhood memory, something my dad used on slot cars. That's right, Snozzleramas. Sit back, relax. Light on the scene. A lot of people wonder where ghouls come from. Well, they come from all over. They have. A lot of ghouls come from Portugal. <laughs> Sorry, I can't get through the whole operation on that track. So you gotta love that old ghoulardy stuff. I used to watch the ghoul on TV. I never knew about ghoulardy. That was earlier. But I guess the ghoul, who's on Channel 50 out of Detroit, must have watched him when he was a kid. Then he came up with a regular ghoul routine. I used to watch him every night. Couldn't wait. He'd always play a lot of those Japanese movies like, you know, Godzilla, Rodan, Ghidra. Good stuff. Made me into the person that you know today. So I've got the amp powered up. You can hear the hiss. So what I want to do is test some of the voltages on this chassis with the Hioki meter. So you can see right now she's on the millivolt range, now it's going to auto range, okay? So in the earlier video I throttled back the negative voltage so that the output tubes would just be kind of running cold, right? Because I didn't know what kind of damage there was to the amp. So we should have some negative voltage right here. Negative 63 volts, okay? Let's check a plate voltage of one of the preamp tubes. I'm going to go way over here. You probably can't see it. Got 300 volts sitting on that guy. 286 on that guy. Let's check the millivolts on one of our output tubes. Get my lead on there. What? 7 millivolts on that one. Like nothing on this one. Ooh, and I thought these output tubes were okay. May have misspoke. All right, hold on. Let's bring up our negative voltage a little bit. That's not good. I'm not getting any current flow. This one adjusts. You see it? I can adjust the current through that tube. But this one, I got nothing. Oh boy. Okay, let's see. Yeah, filaments are on. Interesting. 
All right, first troubleshooting scenario. What is my screen voltage here? Did I put in a bad resistor? There's a screen on that guy. Okay, what do we got over here? Nothing. Interesting, but I have nothing here either. Oh, guess what guys? Take a look right down there. So see there, lesson learned. These wires that just push through with no mechanical connection could fall out. In this case, it killed one of my output tubes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm going to get that soldered back in. <laughs> it's a good thing that this lead popped out instead of this lead popping out with live voltage, right? So that was pretty interesting, wasn't it? And the Hioki caught it. Back to that Air Force conversation, what if I saw like 400 millivolts and assumed that that voltage was good? <laughs> Funny how that stuff comes back around to haunt you. Okay, here we are. 480 there. 479. Okay, 480. 480 okay so now we've got screen voltages so I'm assuming now we should have idle current through each tube there's 10 millivolts on that guy about 14 millivolts on that one so the tubes are not balanced okay I, I would assume that that's natural they're old okay so if you were to bias up your amp which we're going to do right now Bring them up. There's about 21 milliamps through the tube. Over here, 27. So you see, this tube's going to run hotter than this one. That's what the value of a matched set of output tubes does for you, right? So if I said I want this guy to run at 28 milliamps, over here we're going to be higher. See there? 35 milliamps. So it's naturally going to run hotter. It's stable at least, but there's obviously a mismatch. So this tube is weaker than this tube. All right, I just installed a match pair of Tungsol 606s since those old RCAs were obviously damaged in the past. I've throttled back the bias. Got the meter looking at one of the shunts on DC volts. Here we go. Okay. So we'll just call it 28 milliamps for now on this tube. Let's see what we got here. Look at there. 28. That's why they call them match pairs. Okay, so I have a reverb tank hooked up. The tremolo is working. We're ready to give this thing a spin. I'm going to get uh, Tony Kuzmano over here. Let him put his magic ear to it, but I'm sure that this amp is ready. checking out another super reverb and yeah, now this is the one that came from that kid he's like 15 in ohio so okay. he's he's starting off the right way man yeah well, well this comes from a young man yeah he's got him a beautiful amp dude this is a great man this is a place to start uh i wouldn't modify this amp if i were you this amp if you can learn to use the normal channel on this amp some of these Old black faces have a certain amount of magic in the normal channel. They have a little extra ring and sustain. This isn't the greatest one we ever heard, but it's a real, it's a good one. Uh, we've heard a few that are a little better, but this one's right up there. If you listen to that, it just rings 
like a bell. Super reverbs are my favorite. The, uh, I got this one dialed in real nice. <laughs> Yeah, it's working good. All right. Cool deal, man. <laughs> 